Did you have a good day today? Yes. Yeah? Did you have a good day? I had a great day today. Slept for 12 hours, which is a lot for me. I'm normally like an eight-hour guy, so, but I, I needed my sleep. People say to me sometimes, how do you have so much energy? And uh, the answer is you've got to get good sleep. At least, well, for me, at least eight hours a night. That's sort of, I'm an eight-hour guy. You eat good food, you get good exercise, and you smile a lot. Like that. Okay, we've got some awesome things we're going to be talking about tonight. We're doing two sessions tonight. Are you feeling good about that? Sort of warmed up and ready to go. And appreciate the coaching there, Sergio, kind of getting us ready. I'm feeling, you were pumping me up back there, so... All right, our presentation tonight, we're going to pick up exactly where we left off last night, and uh, we're just going to keep building. Now, you remind me, what is this table? This is not just any ordinary glass and metal table. What is this? This is the table of? Very good, the table of truth. And uh, as a bit of a thought experiment, what we're trying to do is to clear the table of truth. Uh, all of us in this room have a variety of things that we believe about, of course, a, a number of things about reality, about geography, about, you know, everything. But we're, we're trying to limit, at least for our purposes in this series, the table of truth to the things that we believe about God, about the Bible, about Christ, about religion, those kinds of things. And uh, I'm asking you to perform a bit of a uh, thought experiment, not one that's easily performed, but one that's going to be important for us. And that is... In as much as it's possible, we're going to clear the table of truth. That is to say, to take everything that we think we know about God, about the Bible, about Christ, about the church, all of these religious stuff that for some of us over many years and others maybe just for a year or two has been accumulating on the table, and we're going to take it off. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not important. No, 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 no. We're taking it off for the purpose of putting things back on in the right way and in their proper orientation. Now, let me just say a quick word about this, because some people might just be sort of put off by the idea that you should have to clear the table of truth at all. They might say, well, wait a minute, if something is true, why would I ever take it off the table? Well, first of all, we're dealing here not with things that are true, but with things that we think are true. And of course, many things on that table we think are true, actually are. Um, but the reason is basically this. Let me just say it this way. Truth, real truth, stands nothing to fear from investigation or scrutiny. Isn't that right? It reminds me of the quotation from Thomas Jefferson. He said, he said um, uh, I think it's actually a variation of a Thomas Jefferson quote that I changed, and it goes something like this. If Christianity were true, I would want to know. Right? Or excuse me, if Christianity were not true, I would want to know. But if it is true, I would want everyone else to know. Do you hear the difference? In other words, if something is not the truth, and I genuinely want to know, I don't want to go on ignorantly believing something that in fact is not true or valid or can, and can withstand scrutiny. So for that purpose, we should have no fear at all in any part of our lives, not just the religious areas, to really examine what it is that we believe and why it is that we believe it and ask ourselves, is that really true? Is that really the case? And when we do that, we will find that things that are actually true, that can stand scrutiny, that are, that are consistent with Scripture and coherent with other uh, truths, will find their way onto the table, and they will remain there. But what we're going to try and do is put things on in their proper way, and we're going to get into that tonight in a, in a very significant way. Okay, having said that, we're going to be talking about the table of truth. What I'd like to do is just pick up right with where we were talking about yesterday when we asked the question, what is the Bible? And uh, we said that the Bible is not a mere list of propositional truths that have been sort of handed down to us from the finger of God. Actually, the Bible is a very human document as well as being a divine document. It's a divine document in the sense that it was God who inspired it. This is the claim of Scripture. But it's a human document in the sense that it says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so what we have here is a synergy of, of the divine and the human coming together to make this document, which is why when we read it, we can recognize the unique styles and, and the unique personalities and, and the unique ways that certain people wrote. You can just read, if you're familiar with the Bible, certain parts and say, oh, that sounds like Paul, or that sounds like Moses, or that sounds like Jeremiah. Well, the reason is, is that Paul actually wrote those words, as did Jeremiah, as did Moses, as did Isaiah. And this is a marvelous thing. 
that God did not just, as it were, you know, send down this document written by God as an author with his own finger on tablets of stone. In fact, there are some portions of Scripture, very small portions of Scripture that were written that way, and we call those the what? What do we call that part? Call that the Ten Commandments, right? So there are certainly small portions of Scripture that God himself wrote. There are other, a couple other instances that you could make the case for. Um, but, it, but in this case, what we're trying to get our fingers wrapped around here, our, our minds wrapped around, is this idea that the Bible is basically a grand and beautiful story. And we looked at what that story is last night. But it's a story that's told in a series of lots of other stories. Right? David and Goliath is one of the stories that make up the, the larger story. Daniel in the lion's den. Jesus walking on water. The feeding of the 5,000. Paul being shipwrecked. The Bible is really... Most of it is an uninterrupted succession of story after story, event after event, chronicle after chronicle, history after history. It's a very human book. And for that reason, when we read it, we can identify with it, even though we're living more than 2,000 and in some cases more than 3,000 years after the events being described. We read it and we think, I can relate to that. I understand that. I, I've had an experience similar to that or analogous to that or something like that. It's not just a list of rules or philosophical statements or... or ch -ch 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 -ch. No, 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 no. Quite the opposite. It is a bunch of stories, personal stories, real stories, lived by real people, written by real people that we can identify with. And so we would say that biblical truth is more than propositional. It's not less than propositional. Certainly there are propositional truths within Scripture. It's not less than propositional, but it's more than propositional. It's also, what is that word there? Personal. It's personal. It's a very accessible, personal, human book. Now, I just want to say a quick word here. When I say that the Bible is a human book, that in no way is demeaning it or belittling it. It's not suggesting any sort of higher critical perspective. All it's saying is, is that it was written by real people under real circumstances who were really trying to communicate. And they did a great job of it. Now... One of the most unquestionably audacious statements in all of the Bible, and we talked about this last night, that Jesus is the hero of the story. Remember John chapter 5, verse 39? Hey, you guys are searching the scriptures. You're reading through your own book, and in them you think you have eternal life, but these are all about, do you remember what Jesus said? He said, that, that they're about me. Right? There's a point to the story. There's a purpose to the story. All of what you're reading, all of those stories, all of those prophecies, all of those narratives are about me. And uh, nowhere in the Bible do we find a more audacious claim than the claim that Jesus made in John chapter 14 in verse 6 when he said these words to Philip. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now I just want to pause there for a moment. When Jesus made this claim, I am the way, the truth, and the life, what he was saying was, I am the way to God. I am telling you the truth about God, and I am living the life of God. I am the point of access, the actual point of access to God. In fact, he went so far as to say, and frankly, it sounds very audacious. He said, no man comes unto the Father but by me. Now, Jesus was either telling the truth or he was completely insane. For somebody to come and say, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one gets access to God except by me, that is a hugely audacious claim. Yeah? I mean, what a remarkable claim. And here's a very interesting thing. In John chapter 18, when Jesus was standing before Pilate, Pilate asked the question. It's very interesting. He asked the question with, with great cynicism as he was just about ready to turn Jesus over to the religious leaders. He said, what is truth. You might recall that story. What is truth? Jesus said, "For the, it, it's the reason I came in this world is to bear witness of the truth. And then Pilate, with great cynicism and almost resignation, says, what is truth? Right? And in the Latin, what he would have said is, quid est veritas. Right? And he would have been speaking Latin. What is truth? And here's a very interesting little thing. I learned this just a couple years ago. Quid est veritas is actually an anagram of what the answer to Pilate's question was. An anagram, of course, is like the words cinema and ice man. You can just rearrange the letters and, and make it say something else. If you rearrange the letters for quid est veritas, you can tur turn it into est vir qui est, which is to say, it is the man standing before you. So Pilate, in his resignation, Pilate, in his cynicism, says, what is the truth? And his words, the letters of the words could have been rearranged, and the answer is 
The truth is the guy who is standing in front of you. And this is a remarkable biblical idea. Don't miss this. That the truth is not merely a concept. It's not an idea. It's not something that's like floating just out in the air. No, 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 no. According to scripture, Jesus was the truth embodied. He was a human being. So, so when we say that the Bible is not merely propositional truth, it's personal truth, truth by its very nature, we're seeing here when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, truth is a personal thing, not merely a propositional statement that floats around in the ethereum. No, Jesus was the truth. And uh, so he said there again, and I think I've just got it here, John 5, 39. He said, uh, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they that testify of me. So if we were going to summarize what is the Bible, we would say it's the story of Jesus. The overarching meta-narrative of the story of Jesus. And we looked at that last night. The Old Testament, foundation for Christ, preparation for Christ, aspiration for Christ, expectation of Christ. Then we come to the New Testament. There's manifestation of Christ and propagation of Christ and application of Christ. And finally, in Revelation, the consummation of Christ. The whole biblical narrative, if you just sort of put Jesus there in the center, the whole biblical narrative just orbits around the figure Jesus. In fact, there's this amazing passage in the New Testament. And uh, maybe I'll just quickly show it to you if you have your Bibles there. If you don't, I'll just read it for you. This is a remarkable claim that the Apostle Paul makes in the New Testament. Now, Paul was a converted Jew. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he's actually describing the experience of his own people, the Jewish people, who had, much to his dismay and to his great sadness, denied the very Jewish Messiah, their own Messiah. So in the same way that Jesus was saying, you're misreading your own book. Reread your book. This is how it sounds. Paul here is saying, many of you missed your own Messiah. You, you missed it. He, he, he came. He, he already went. We, we, he was crucified. Now, here's an interesting thing. Paul, in a, in a very poignant and yet significant passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I wish I had time to develop the whole argument, but I just want to make one point here. He, I'll just begin in verse 13, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 3, verse 14. He says, but their minds were blinded. He's speaking of his own people, the the, many of the Jewish people of his day, and particularly the Jewish religious leaders. But their eyes were blinded, for until this day, he says, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Because, he says, the veil is taken away in Christ. Now, let me just paint the picture here. Paul has just finished talking about the experience of Moses. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, his face was shining. And his face was, was so bright, so glorious, so incandescent that, that the Israelites said, hey, put a veil over your face. We can't bear to look on your face. And so the, the story says in the Old Testament, it says that Moses put a veil over his face. Right? So Paul takes this analogy of Moses putting a veil over his face and he says, ah, this is a, this is a great object lesson. Because Moses, who wrote much of the Old Testament, of course the first five books and probably the book of Job as well, he says... Many of the religious leaders of my day, first century Judaism, he said, they're reading Moses, but just as Moses had a veil over his face in the Old Testament, they're reading Moses with a veil over their face. They are not discerning or seeing in their own scriptures the very point of the scriptures. And let me read it to you again, the last part of verse 14. He says, because the veil, this veil that was covering the face of many first century religious Jews... He says that veil is taken away in what? What does he say? In Christ. In other words, when you start reading the Old Testament with Jesus as the center around which all things orbit, he says when you start reading the Old Testament as it was designed to be read, he said it's like, it's like seeing with new eyes. The veil literally just falls away. And, oh, I tell you, I wish I had time to sort of develop this. But there's an interesting little verse, one of the strangest verses in the writings of Paul. He says, in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 2 or 3, he says, for I, through the law, died to the law. What a crazy thing to say. I, through the law, died to the law. And many of us read that we think, what? That's double talk. That's, That's silly speech. What does that even mean? Let me tell you what it means. First of all, the law for Paul just means the writings of Moses in particular and especially the Old Testament. It's it's, it's the Old Testament. It's it's the law. It's, It's the Jewish writings. And what Paul is saying is, I went back and I read my own book. 
I went back and read the Old Testament. I went back and read the writings of Moses, but I read it with a new center, with a new perspective. And he said, when I went back and read it, not with me as the center, not with my obedience as the center, not with my nation as the center, but with God's Messiah Christ as the center, he said, I went back to the law, and through the reading of the law, I died to the old way of reading the law, and the veil came off. I just was reading my own book in a totally new and wonderful way. Verse 15, he says, But even to this day, when Moses is read in the synagogue, a veil lies on their heart or on their mind. Verse 16, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, right, just as, just as Saul did, when one tur- Paul, when one turns to the Lord, he says, The veil is taken away. And this is a marvelous, marvelous story. It's actually quite a sad one. Verse 17 says, Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And uh, again here, I'm just sort of making this very simple point. We're asking the question, what is the Bible? Because we have to start somewhere with regards to the table of truth. And uh, a person could be inclined to say, well, how do you know the Bible is true? How, do you, how can you prove that? Well, we have to all start somewhere. And for our purposes here, because of the time constraints that we have... We're accepting the Bible on its own terms. We're just going to say, okay, what is this book fundamentally about? And uh, as we've seen just in the short time that we've, ha- that we've had together, the Bible is the story of God in Christ revealing himself. But now we're going to ask a question. We transition. And we're going to say, okay, well, who is this God? Who, who is this God? I mean, if Jesus had the temerity, the audacity to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way to God, I am the truth about God, and I am living the life of God. It raises a huge question for me, and I'm sure for many of you, and that is, who is God? What are we talking about when we talk about a God? Um, If I say to you, um, hippopotamus, do you get a word picture in your mind? Yeah, you you know what hippopotamus, I'll tell you a funny story about that real quick. One time, several years ago, I could not remember the word hippopotamus for the life of me. Do you ever have one of those things where you just can't remember? And, uh, of course, I could have asked, uh, my friend Daniel Mesa was in the room, and I could have easily just said, hey, Daniel, what's that big animal, the big gray one that lives in the rivers in Africa with the funny teeth? What's that thing? I can't remember. I kept wanting to say rhinoceros, but I knew that was the one with the horn. And it was just like, you know, two synapses were not connected in my brain, but I just can be really stubborn sometimes, basically all the time. And... uh, I just kind of internalized it, and I just decided, I'm not going to ask. I'm going to wait until I can remember what, what is, it's not a giraffe, it's not a leopard, it's not a rhino, what is that thing? And I kind of put it out of my mind, but then it would come back, and I would try to remember, and two days later, it came into my mind. (laughs) True story. Two days later, I was sitting in a room with my friend Daniel and my friend Eugene, and I just burst out, and I said, just in quietness, hippopotamus, (laughs) and they were like, what? We've always thought he was crazy, but now we have proof positive. The guy is completely loony. And uh, so, so here's kind of the point. If I say to you, hippopotamus, you get a mental picture, right? Has anyone here ever seen a hippopotamus in the wild? Zoos don't count. Okay. Yeah, me too. Me too. And if I say rhinoceros, you get a mental picture, right? You know what that looks like. Anyone here seen a rhino in the wild? Okay, a few of you. Now, we could go right down the list. We could say things like a school bus. You'll get a mental picture in your mind, you know, whatever it is. But if I say God, what kind of a mental picture do you get? Now, let me just say this. First of all, if you get any kind of 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 a concrete, tactile mental picture, it's almost certainly wrong, right? Let me just let you know that right up front. I can remember for a long time... Uh, the picture that I had in my mind of God was a picture that somebody painted, and I suppose there are certain hints in the Old Testament that sort of indicate this direction. But it was of a man, you know, an old... Of course, he's an old man. I mean, God's been around for a long time, so he's got to be old, you know, with the wild eyebrows and the, the long gray beard sitting on a throne, looking very stoic, very patriarchal, very regal, right? And this is God. Now, don't get me wrong. There are certainly passages in the Old Testament that talk about the Ancient of Days, Right? But it is interesting that, that on one occasion, God, when he was speaking to Moses, let's go back to Moses on top of, of the mountain, God was very specific with Moses. He said things like this, and you remind those Israelites, Moses, that when I was on the mountain and when I spoke to them from the heavens, they saw no form or figure. 
They can't make anything that looks like me because they didn't see what I look like. There was the thundering and the lightning and the, the clouds and the smoke. But he says again, they, there was nothing. They saw no form, no figure. In fact, the best that they could do when they uh, initiated their covenant breaking, their rebellion, is they made a golden, do you remember what it was? A golden calf. And there's no way that what they saw atop Sinai's summit was a calf. But they had been so brainwashed into thinking like the Egyptians were thinking, that, that, that God is kind of like us. He's like a frog, or he's a dog, or he's a cow, or he's a whatever. God said, no, 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 you don't know what I look like. On one occasion in the New Testament, Jesus was speaking to the religious leaders of his day, and he said, you have never seen his form nor heard his voice. I say hippopotamus, and you can get a mental picture. So too rhino, so too school bus, so too any number of things. But when we say God, we are dealing with something that none of us really knows what? Now, there are, of course, many billion people on this planet, in excess, I think, now of seven billion. And there are lots and lots and lots of different religions and, and ways of looking at God and ways of thinking about God. And at the risk of oversimplifying a little bit, I'm going to suggest to you tonight that even though there are seemingly you know, innumerable myriads of, way of ways of thinking about God. I'm going to suggest to you tonight that there's really only three ways of thinking about God. That, that every person that thinks about God in, in, in whatever way they do, their own unique, personal, cultural, idiosyncratic way, it can fit into one of three basic categories. Okay? So, at the risk of slightly oversimplifying, it's actually not an oversimplification in my opinion, it's just a simplification, I want to share those three ways with you, okay? And the first one you can see here on the screen is atheism. Um, atheism is just exactly what the word sounds like in the Greek or in the Latin. Whenever you take the, the prefix a and you put it on the front of a Latin word or a Greek word or even in many English words, it means the negation of that thing. So if you have something, for example, that is symmetrical, it means, for example, my Bible here in this case as a shape would be symmetrical, right? Because if I fold it in half, those two halves are the same shape and the same size, so we would call that symmetrical. But if you have a piece of paper or something that's cut out and it's not symmetrical, um, like, for example, these, this little shape here, right, that's asymmetrical, where this is symmetrical, I believe. See, symmetrical, if we were to fold that in on itself, we'd have two sides exactly the same. But this object, well, actually you could turn it on its end this way and get it to be symmetrical as well. But you can get the idea in your mind of an asymmetrical shape. All that the prefix A does is serves to say the negation of that thing. Okay? So in the case of atheism, it's the negation of the idea of God, theos, the Greek theos. So it's atheism, without God or no God. And so the idea of atheism is basically that all of this talk that I've been doing tonight and all the talk that I did yesterday um, is complete nonsense. It's just jibber-jabber. It's, it's useless. It's just poppycock, balderdash. There's nothing to it. I'm talking about nothing. I might as well be talking about the Tooth Fairy or Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or whatever. There's just, there is no such thing as a god, and that's atheism. And uh, in an atheistic worldview or in an atheistic perspective, Basically, the universe, and that's what that circle there represents, the universe, all of the known universe, everything in existence, consists of two fundamental constituents, and that's matter and energy. It's, everything is made up of matter and energy. Everything from this stage to this building to these shoes to you, to me. Everything is made up in various and sundry permutations and... and and configurations, matter and energy, okay? Stars and supernovas and orangutans and hippos and people and chairs and apartment complexes. It's just different configurations of matter and energy. That's atheism. And there's no God in this universe because there's no room for a God and there's no need for a God because a God is not made out of matter or energy and so therefore he's excluded just on the basis of being a non-material being, something not made out of matter. And so the atheist would say, no, we, there is no God and we don't need a God. This is their basic conception of the universe, matter and energy. Um, another way, though, the second way of basically thinking about God is like this. It's what we call monism. And uh, it sounds pretty similar to the word uh, that uh, you might imagine, mono, right? And what does mono mean? One. And uh, monism, in the theological sense, theological monism, just means that God and the universe are one. 
They're one. So, so it would be sort of diagrammed like this. God and the universe are one entity. And there are whole uh, religious systems that basically have this idea. Their fundamental idea about the nature of the universe is that the divine, the God, uh, is, in fact, everything. And uh, you perceive distinctions between, for example, me and you, or you and the chair, or you and, and uh, the animal kingdom, or whatever. But all of those apparent distinctions are actually illusions. In fact, the great truth of the universe is that all is one, and you arrive at an understanding or enlightenment of this oneness by various ceremonies, rituals, and meditations. You, you have to learn to disabuse your mind of the idea that there are distinctions because the truth about reality is that everything is one. And uh, in these various religious systems, the goal is to become at one intellectually and spiritually with everything else that is one. And when you do that, you achieve enlightenment. And uh, this is basically called monism or theological monism. When you, one of the major sort of problems um, with this faith, and I'm not here to sort of point out, you know, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, my faith is better than your faith, no. But one of the sort of problems that does arise in a monistic system is that your own sense of individuality and personal identity is, is just an illusion. And it gets kind of problematic because your job is to almost undermine your own identity and your own individuality so that you can become subsumed into the great oneness. And uh, that's just another way of thinking about God. We're not going to spend any time talking about the pros or cons of it necessarily. And this is the sort of third and final way of thinking about God. It is that uh, it's just what we call theism. Um, and that is that God made the universe and is distinct from it. Right? And so over here you have a God or gods in a polytheistic system. You could have more than one God. And uh, he or they made the universe. In other words, they are not the universe, but they made it as distinct from them. In the same way that an, an artist or a builder might make a table. He is not the table, but he made the table or she made the table. So at the risk of slightly oversimplifying, basically every religious system that you can think of, from Islam to Buddhism to Hinduism to Christianity to Judaism to Taoism to agnosticism to animism, just about everything that you can think of will fit into one of three basic categories. Either, number one, there is no God. Number two, God and the universe are all the same thing. Or number three, the universe is something that God or gods made. So far so good, did I lose anybody there? Okay, so that sort of helps you to kind of get a picture of the different ways that people view the supernatural or the transcendent. Now, of those, which one does the Bible teach? Does it teach that there is no God? Does it teach that God and the universe are the same thing? Okay, that only leaves us one option, that God is the creator of the universe and is distinct from it. And not surprisingly, that's exactly how Scripture opens. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so right out of the gate, you have an indication as to which direction uh, the Bible writers are going to go. Not that there is no God, of course. The Bible wouldn't make much sense in, in that context. Um, not that God and the universe are one, but that God made the universe, and he is distinct from it. In the same way that an artisan would make a table or paint a painting or a sculpture, he made it and is distinct from the thing. Now, with that sort of in mind... We want to talk about, in this view, this view here, okay, what is a God then? If God is, is analogous to the person that makes the table or that paints the painting or that makes the sculpture, we all know what a human being is, we know what a builder is, we know what an artist is, but what is a God? And let me give you the short answer. We have no idea. Nobody knows. We, we don't know what a God is in his essential nature or in its essential nature. And there are good reasons for this. Um, first of all, let me just sort of introduce you to some of the words that theologians and philosophers historically use to describe God. And there are good reasons for these words, but ultimately what these words are doing is masking our ignorance about what we're talking about. Uh, the first word is omnipotent, um, which just means all-powerful, omnipotent. Uh, and as you read the Bible or the Quran or, or other holy books, the picture emerges um, pretty clearly that, that God is really powerful. 
And uh, he must be supremely powerful to hold in place all of the vast universe, or at least in the cases of some religious systems, to have gotten it started. And so, because he's clearly more powerful than you or me or the United States of America or the Republic of China, I mean, he's really, really powerful, and we don't know exactly how powerful, but, but ju by judging by the size and the scope of the universe, anybody who's ever sat out under, uh, you know, I just got done camping, I just spent the last three weeks backpacking around the Sierras, um, the eastern Sierras in California, I mean, the stars are amazing, Yeah. You have a lot of light pollution in areas like this because of the, the city, but if you get out in a place where there are no lights, how many of us have done that before, and you look up and you see the stars and it's just like, you suddenly have an awareness that you are very small and the universe is very big. But the truth of the matter is, is that you are seeing a fraction of 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 a percentage of the universe. And you feel really, 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 really small. Right? And so intelligent people have sort of looked at the size of the universe and they've sort of looked at the sun and the, the, they've said, man, whoever designed all this and put it all together must be really powerful. Ding, 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 ding. He's omnipotent. Make sense? But we don't really know what we're talking about. Now, the second one here is very similar. It's omniscient. Not only must he, it, be really powerful, he must know a lot in order to have put it all together. And uh, as our scientific knowledge has increased, and I'm going to talk about this in our second presentation, our awareness of the complexity of the world has also increased. And it's become really obvious that at both the macro-universal level and the micro-level down at the cellular and, and even the non-biological world, that the world is very complex. And so we say, man, must have, must have been smart to figure all that out. Right? Must have been really smart to have put it all together. And so we say, well, he's a lot smarter than me. And so we say he's omniscient. It comes from omniscience. Right? All-knowing. He knows everything. And uh, omnipresent is just exactly what it sounds like. If God is, as he appears to be, transcendent to his creation, having made the universe, he cannot be either bound by time or space. He appears to transcend space as we understand it, and even to some degree to transcend time as we understand it. And that gives him the ability somehow to be omnipresent both geographically and apparently chronologically as well. He can be here and here and here and here in space and here and here and here and here in time. In fact, it's very interesting. When, just as an illustration of this, when God was speaking to Moses and he said, go tell Pharaoh to let my children go, my son, my firstborn, we just mentioned that last night, Israel... Moses protested, and he said, well, who shall I say sent me? And you remember, God said a very fascinating thing. He, well, you would know. He said, I, I am. And am is the present tense of the verb to be. I, I am. I am in existence. And by contrast, I have always been, or by extension, I have always been in existence. I will always be in existence. I am. What, is, what an unusual way to define yourself, but not really if you're God. God, at, at some level and in some way, transcends time and space, and the simple English word that we sort of throw at the wall and hope it sticks, we think it means something, is omnipresent. Right? Unlike me, who I've been stuck for the last 20 years in this 5 foot 8, 145 pound frame. I'm, I'm here. I'm stuck here. Don't get me wrong. I love being stuck with you guys. But... But I can't also be in Hawaii and also be in, you know, Bengal, India. I'm here tonight, right? And I'm just confined by space and by time as well. Um, we also say that God is eternal, which, which is just another way of saying that he appears not to have had a beginning or an end, which is the thing I was just talking about there with I am. None of us in this room can relate to that. I had a beginning August 16th, 1972, right? I can't imagine what... what I, trying to think of myself in, uh, say, August 16th of 1942, well, there is no myself, right? I had a beginning. There was a very, there was a very specific time and place when David Asherick came into the world, right? And I think the world's been a little better since I've shown up. Um, <laughs> my world has been considerably better than it was before I showed up, by the way. Um, probably you think that the world is doing a little better off with you in it, too, and that's a good... I hope it is the case. Um, in fact... I was just reflecting on this the other day. Um, if you've ever seen like a movie or a commercial or a television show or something or a, a car accident or whatever where someone gets killed or hurt, 
you never imagine yourself as the person that gets killed or hurt. You always imagine yourself as the people that are standing around looking at the person that's dead. Because you can't really imagine your own death. Right? How would that be? Yeah. So you imagine that you're around. You, it couldn't have been you that died because everybody else is always dying. You've never died yet. Right? And uh, therefore, you can't even imagine the world without you because in order for you to imagine the world without you, you're there imagining it. Right? No. But uh, the truth is, you know, there are only two things sure in life, death and taxes. And you came into the world and you've been around since you can remember. And when you go out of the world, okay, according to the Bible, then you're thoughts, your emotions, your dreams, and all that just ceases to exist, which is a state that you can't imagine, because in order for you to imagine it, you'd have to be around to imagine it. Make sense? But God is not like this. God didn't have a beginning or an end. He has always been. He's eternal. And no one in this room can relate to that or understand it. Well, again, this is just another word that we sort of concoct. We'll call it eternal. And we throw it at the wall. We hope it sticks. But we don't really even know what we're describing. It's like a one-ended stick. You just try to imagine that, a one, or a stick with no ends, right? And then finally, we say that God is a spirit, and Jesus himself said that one time when he was speaking to the woman at the well. He said, God is a spirit in John chapter 4. And here's an interesting thing about spirit. Nobody knows what we're talking about when we talk about a spirit. In fact, all of the words that we use for spirit are what a spirit isn't, right? For example, Jesus one time was was speaking to his disciples, and his disciples thought that he was a ghost, and he said a very interesting thing. This was post-resurrection. He said, no, 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 no. Touch me and feel me, because a spirit doesn't have, do you know this? A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like you see me having. The word spirit literally means, or we take it to mean, immaterial, not made of matter, right? So this is a very interesting thing. We don't know what a spirit is, but we know what it isn't. All of our word associations with spirit are not saying anything positive about what a spirit is, but only a negative about what it's not. A spirit does not have flesh and bones. A spirit does not have a physical body, or at least is not bound like a physical body by a physical body like we are. A spirit is not material. So even here again, in each of these instances, we know we're saying something, and we sense that we're saying something significant, but we're not quite sure what we're describing. If we say hippopotamus, we know what we're talking about. If we say giraffe, we know what we're talking about. If we say human being, we know what we're talking about. But the moment we start talking about God in his essential nature, the very best that we can do is invent multisyllabic words and say it's something like that. He must be really strong, really powerful, transcending time and space without beginning or end, and that's basically it. Which is why the title of the presentation tonight is not, What is God? Because that would be a really easy one. We don't know. The title of the presentation is actually significant. It's, Who is God? Which is a very different conversation. The what is God deals with God's basic nature. And we know very little to nothing about it. I mean, we know a few things, but we know the veritable tip of the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg in terms of what God is. But Scripture, this book, has a whole lot to say about who He is. Don't get me wrong. There is some material in here about what He is. But it's it's veiled. It's, It's almost, I wouldn't say hidden, but it's necessarily hidden because we lack the vocabulary and the intellect to really even grasp it. But who He is, now that's a whole, that's a whole different animal. What kind of a person is he? And the Bible reveals him as many different things. We're not going to go to all of the verses here, but I'll just give you a couple quick ones. The Bible reveals God as uh, the creator of all things that are good. That's right there in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He's the creator. It It reveals God as the standard of all things good. We find God saying repeatedly in Scripture things like this. You be holy because I am holy. It's very interesting what the word holy means. If I say holy for for many of us, for many of you, you probably get a very religious idea in your mind. I don't know what you get in your mind, but but for many of us, we we get a picture of holiness that is patently or decidedly religious, where the word holy literally just means different. It means different. Other. 
So when God says, I'm holy, he's not really making even a religious claim in the sense that we sometimes might get a picture of a religious figure, you know, garbed in religious clothing, whatever that might be. For the Catholic, they're going to get one picture of what holy looks like. The Orthodox will get another picture of what holy looks like. The Evangelical will get another picture of what holy looks like. The Adventists will get a picture of what holy looks like. But, but holy in the biblical sense, in its most basic sense, means different. God says, I am holy, I am different. And by, by extension, by, by implication, it's different than the world and the way this world runs. And we're going to talk a lot more about that over the time, our time together. So God says, I'm holy, so you be holy. I'm the standard of all things good. Going back to Moses on top of the mountain, because that's such an amazing experience, God actually had Moses request of him, who are you, what are you like? And in declaring his name to Moses, one of the things he said is that I am the Lord, the Lord God, merciful. Right? Merciful, forgiving. And so we, we see this idea that, that God is a forgiving God, that he's a merciful God, that he doesn't hold grudges. He doesn't, and that's going to uh, become important for us here in a bit. The Bible also reveals God as the rescuer of his own creation. We, we just mentioned briefly last night that even if you're an atheist or an agnostic or somebody who's not sure about religious things, even if you don't believe the biblical story, you have to, I think, appreciate it just for its aesthetic beauty. I mean, it's really a great, it's a, it's a great, beautiful tale. The creator makes the creation. He breathes into that creation the ability to think and to feel and to hope and to dream and to do. And then that creation rebels against the creator. And the creator, rather than going to war with his creation, he actually goes to a, to a totally different kind of war. He gives himself to the creation. He humbles himself before it. He condescends before it. And the creation ends up taking the life of the creator, the creator rises again and calls the creation back to himself. It's a beautiful love story. It's an awesome story. And even if somebody says, I don't believe it, it's very difficult for someone to say with a straight face, that's not a beautiful story. Are you with me on that? And so we say that God is, he's the savior. And so to sort of summarize here, we could say who is God, and, and it would be totally appropriate to say that God is the creator, that God is holy, that God is merciful, and that God is the savior. But there is no passage, single passage in Scripture, that more clearly defines and unwraps for us this grand mystery of who and what he is than this simple three-word, three-syllable phrase communicated in the little book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, John says these words. He that does not love does not know God because God is love. What? God is love. And you can just imagine that we are like children going up to a door, right? And the door has one of those old-fashioned style locks. And, and we're sort of peering through the lock, looking in. And again, while we cannot discern everything that's inside of that room, we don't know what God is. We don't know about his omnipotence, his omniscience, his eternality, and all of that. What John does here, what the Bible does, and what John in particular does, is he gives us a little keyhole through which we can sort of do our best to crane our necks and see what is going on in there. And what John says is that here is a grammatical and theological equivalence. He says, you want to know about God? You want to know who he is? You want to know what he is? He is not merely loving, which would be an adjective describing a behavior or a characteristic. He said, he's love. And I'll tell you right now, let me just pause and say this. If that is true, and I believe it is with all of my heart, you cannot imagine better good news than that. You can't. I mean, just imagine the best possible good news that you could think of right now. Somebody says, okay, okay, anything, just really good news, anything. You know, let your imagination run wild. What's the best good news you can think of? Somebody says, oh, that I went to my bank account, to my ATM to take out some money, and when I, when I got the money out, there was six zeros on the end of my account. And not a dot with six zeros, but six zeros and then the dot. Whoa, that'd be really good news, wouldn't it? If you were suddenly like a millionaire or a billionaire um, or a trillionaire maybe even. I mean, that could be really good news. I mean, it would be good news for me. I'd be happy. I mean, I'd take you all out to dinner if I was suddenly a trillionaire. True story. Um, so that would be good news. But, but that good news would not even begin to compare. In fact, no good news that you can possibly conceive of would even begin to compare 
with the idea that there is a God and that he made you and that in his innermost essence, his very nature and his very character, he is love. It is the best possible good news. Now, let me just ask you kind of a question here. It's a bit of a trick question, but you're a smart group, and I think you'll get it. It's really tricky since what I was just saying might have sort of set you up to give the wrong answer, but we'll try. Is it good news that there is a God? <laughs> Who said that? You are exact. Have you heard me say that before? Okay, yeah, you're cheating. Okay, she's cheating. Complete cheater right there in the front row. Okay, everybody but her, I'm going to ask you again. Is it good news that there is a God? Yeah, you're all inclined to say yes. And the answer is not necessarily. Now, let me ask you this question. Maybe this will help. Is it good news that there is a husband? <laughs> Somebody says no. Okay, and we have a counselor waiting outside to see you when we're done. Okay. <laughs> this is a troublesome group. Are you guys from Maryland? Okay. So let me, what do you think? I'm asking a serious question. Is it good news that there's a husband? Oh, let me tell you. It might be. It would depend on what kind of a husband we're talking about. But just, there's a husband, right? You want to know what... In other words, if you just went to a lady who was single and said, hey, you want a husband? She's not just going to say, oh, yeah. Yeah, just, just any old husband. Just, just throw him at me. No. You want to know what kind of a husband, what kind of a person is he? You want to know who is he, right? So when I say to you, is it good news that there's a God, your natural inclination, because you already are thinking good thoughts about God, are to say yes. But I can tell you this. I can think of a lot more gods that I am perfectly happy do not exist than I can think of who do exist. In other words, I would basically say I would be... Prefer, I, would per, I would prefer to be an atheist to all gods that I can think of except one. Right? So it's not necessarily good news that there is a God. The question is, is what's he like? What kind of a God are we talking about? But if what John says is true, if as we go creep up to that little, that little uh, you know, peephole, the keyhole, and we're looking through it, and, ooh, well, that looks really good. Yeah? I mean, God is what? God is what? God is love. Notice that, that it does not say God is loving. Loving would be an adjective describing a behavior. I can be loving. You can ask my wife. She's sitting right over here. She'll tell you. David can be loving. Um, but she would never say David is love. This is a grammatical theological equivalence that gives us access to a picture and a portrait of God that is absolutely amazing. You will search the scriptures in vain to find the phrase, God is power. You will not find the passage that, that God is might. You won't even find the passage that says God is grace or God is mercy. But you will find passages that say God is gracious, God is merciful, God is powerful, God is mighty. But what we have here with God is love is an equivalence. God is this very thing, the thing that is this love, that is what God is in his nature and in his character. Now, the awesome thing here is that it, it sort of unfolds for us a picture and a portrait of, of what we're talking about when we talk about a God. Even though we don't know what all those words, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, all that stuff. Brrr. When Jesus stood before Pilate and Pilate said in exasperation and resignation, what is the truth? Well, what if this guy is the truth? What if what he said is true? I am the way the truth and the life. I am the truth about God. I am living the life of God and I am the way to God. Jesus made the audacious claim to be the very personification, the very incarnation, the very embodiment of who and what God is. And I'll tell you this. If God is like Jesus, this is really good news. Do you know how I know that? I read his story. 
I read the story in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and I, I read about a guy who was healing. I read about, about a guy who was a teacher, who was kind, who was gracious, who was forgiving, who was principled, uh, a person who could not be bought, who could not be bribed, who could not be controlled or otherwise cajoled. I, I read about a person who treated, who treated the prostitute and the profligate in a tremendous and wonderful and magnanimous way. I read about someone who said, oh, no, 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 let the kids come. I want to, let me spend time. I mean, if, if, if that's what God is like, the picture of Jesus as presented in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this is extremely good news. In fact, I'll go out on a limb again and say, you can't even think of better news. God is not defined here primarily by his power, by his puissance or his strength. God's strength comes from a totally different place. His strength is not so much in his nature, but his real strength is in his character. Not so much what he is, but who he is. And scripture says, God is is love. Now this, this central truth about the nature and character of God is going to be the first and most significant piece of truth that we're going to place on the table of truth. We're going to take that thing and we're going to put it right in the middle of the table of truth. God is love. And what we're going to discover is that every other truth that makes its way under the table of truth will be scrutinized. Every other thing that somebody might say is true about God or that they believe about God or whatever, that's fine. We'll hear it. We'll hear you out. We'll hear anybody out. But, but we're going to take that thing, whatever it is, and we're going to examine it. We're going to put it on the table of truth for some evaluation, for some analysis, for some scrutiny. And ultimately, it's going to come down to right, these two things right here, in fact. The, the first thing that we'll say is, is it apparently scriptural? Does it seem to be taught in scripture, right? That's our, one of our standards that we've already talked about. And the other one is, does it square with this idea that God is love? And if this truth, this claim to truth, whatever it is, cannot square with Scripture and with this truth that God is love, guess what? It doesn't get on the table. It, does, it just, it's not on the table. It can go somewhere else. It can go in the rubbish heap of bad ideas about who and what God is. But it doesn't make its way onto the table. Now check this out. If we bring something to the table that seems like it might be true... Yeah, that, that sounds reasonable. That sounds about right. And we begin to compare it to this central truth here, this, this normative and non-negotiable truth. Now, let me just describe to you what I mean by normative and non-negotiable. If we begin to compare them and we find that there is discrepancy between this and this, now check this out, this never comes off the table. Never. It's never replaced by some other picture of who or what God is. This is both normative, which means it's the standard by which every other truth about God is gauged. And it's non-negotiable, which means it never comes off. This, because John is telling us here something, not just about God's person, not just rather about God's character only. He's telling us something about God's character and his nature. And if, if the, when we put the three sort of pictures up there of, of different ways to think about God, there is no God, God and the universe are one, and God made the universe... If God made the universe and he is eternal, it means that he preceded, he antedated all things. Which means that any statement about God would be a statement about absolute reality. Right? And if scripture says that God is love, no subsequent idea, no subsequent truth, if it's held up against these two and there seems to be a little bit of disagreement, this never comes off the table because no subsequent idea could ever erase that from our mind. We together, everyone? You follow that basic idea? So as we begin to build on our table of truth here, asking the question, who is God? We are never going to take away the idea that God is love. And Jesus came to show that. In John chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus said these words. He said, greater love has no man than this. A man would lay down his life for his friends. Okay. So here's this basic idea that the essence, the sort of guts of what makes love love is that it is other-centered, it's self-giving. This will become hugely important for us tomorrow night. We're going to have a presentation titled, Who Was Right, Jesus or Darwin? Who Was Right? And uh, Jesus here is advocating this idea that love is the basic principle of putting someone else before oneself. That, that love puts others first. Greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Now, if we take that idea, that basic idea about what love is, love is the principle of putting others first. And we remind ourselves 
that God is love, this tells us that God is not looking out primarily for himself. That God is not looking out for his own needs, wants, hopes, desires, ambitions. God is presented in Scripture as looking out for others. In fact, the, the so-called love chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which gives us a long list of what love is and what love isn't. In verse 5, when Paul's describing love, he says a fascinating thing. He says, love does not seek its own. What that means is that love is not looking out for its own interests, its own hopes, its own dreams, and its own desires. Love is not about me, more, mine. Right? What Paul is saying and what Jesus here is saying is that love is about giving. Love isn't about selfishness. Love is about others. Love is not the principle of putting oneself first. It's, it's this principle. It's this idea. It's this magnanimity of putting others first. And Scripture says, oh yeah, that's what God is. God is the very embodiment of the principle of living for others and putting others first. And wouldn't you know it, we see that very thing embodied in the life of Jesus. Right? So here we are again. Is it good news that there's a God? Maybe, maybe not. But is it good news if God is like Jesus? Oh, this is amazingly good news. Because when we go to Matthew, when we go to Mark, when we go to John, when we go to Luke, we see Jesus. We see this figure who is consistently, uh, perennially, um, uh, insistently giving himself for others. So much so that the consummation of each of the gospel stories is Jesus dying on a cross, not for his own sins, not for his own rebelliousness or his own failures, but for others. And here in, in, in the death of Jesus on the cross, we have, if, if, if Scripture is to be believed, and I, I, I think it is, the very picture of what God is. And here's the remarkable thing. We'll talk about this tomorrow night. God is the most powerful being in the universe in terms of his essential nature and character. But in, his, in terms of his essential, in terms of his essential nature, but in terms of his essential character, the person who he is, he's the most humble being in the universe. Now just let that sink in. The most powerful is the most humble, is the most gracious, is the most magnanimous, is the most kind, is the most forgiving. And that is really, really good news. And that's who God is.